All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you all to the Museum of the Albemarle for today's History for Lunch program. And we have quite the turnout, which is awesome. Uh, we are streaming this as well on Zoom. So we just ask uh, those of y'all who are virtual to mute your microphone and then use the chat for your questions. Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, uh, followed by a book signing out in the lobby. And you can also pick up a copy of Mr. Hampton's book in the museum shop. Uh, I will also mention that our next History for Lunch is scheduled for Wednesday, November 1st at noon. Uh, it's a lecture and book signing with Bill Barber. Uh, he's going to provide insight onto the timber boom that swept uh, through coastal North Carolina after the Civil War. Uh, so be sure to join us on November the 1st. Uh, now, today we welcome local journalist and author Jeff Hampton. Uh, he's going to tell us stories about the wild horses of Kerala and their protectors uh, who have roamed the Currituck Outer Banks for nearly 500 years. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Mr. Hampton. Thank you. He was a little taller. <laughs> so I'm glad to be here. Good afternoon. Uh, just a little bit of introduction about myself. I, I was a reporter for thir over 30 years, and uh, I worked for the Virginian Pilot, covering eastern North Carolina, and based here in Elizabeth City for a large part of it. And then they closed our office down, so they sent me to my house, and I worked out of my house and mostly covered the Outer Banks during the 25 years that I wrote for the pilot. Um, and during that time, I wrote uh, dozens of stories about the wild horses. So uh, when the time came to retire, uh, the la I remember it was a Wednesday, uh, two years ago, and uh, it was like Monday or something like that before that. And uh, I was talking to Meg Puckett, who's the herd manager who's here today, and I uh, wanted to do a story about the stallions and how they fight. And uh, so that was the very last story I wrote for the Virginian pilot, was how stallions fight. <laughs> and of the hundreds and hundreds of stories, I wrote a couple of hundred stories a year for the pilot. So well, <laughs> I didn't know that move. I thought it was me for a minute. <laughs> So we'll get into the long story of survival uh, for these wild horses. So you remember now that we don't celebrate it as much as we used to, but uh, I think it was last Monday, what was the holiday? Columbus Day, right? So let's see. We don't celebrate it. When I was a kid in school, you know, you celebrated and talked about Columbus a lot more. But he is credited in large degree to when he, he in there's the ditty, you know, Columbus, uh, let's see here, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. Well, guess what? He came back in 1493, too. And he brought horses this time. And I don't know how many trips he made with horses, not many more. There was that one for sure. And then they started raising them on ranches uh, throughout South America and, and um, Mexico. And uh, from these ranches, these explorers started bringing horses up this way into the American West and even to the, co the Eastern coast. And one of the explorers, uh, Lucas, there may be Spanish speakers in here, I might massacre this, but Lucas Vasquez de Ayon, attempted to settle in Cape Fear. And it was a disease that ran through the um, settlement there and killed a bunch of them, including him. And they abandoned that settlement and left their horses according to historical accounts. So that's just one of the more viable ways that these horses got to Kerala and Karova. There are other ways, there's stories of shipwrecks. There's no actual factual account of a shipwreck when horses and they came ashore. There's theories of that. And other explorers came up this way as well. And uh, some of the English explorers even may have brought some horses in here too. So that's the story of how they first got here. 
All right. So um, through the decades, they were seen by different people. Uh, John Lawson, who was here in the early 1700s, reported seeing the wild horses on the coast. And then there's the story of uh, Betsy Dowdy's ride, uh, where she had heard that uh, the, the word came down to where she lived over there in Corova Beach now, that uh, there were some um, troops coming to, to North Carolina, and there was a group into Norfolk, and there was a group uh, down in uh, Perquimans that uh, of revolutionaries. And she felt the need to get her wild horse, uh, called her up, what was her name? Beth. Beth. Beth, yeah. Her wild horse, Beth, called her out from the marsh and jumped on, the, jumped on her back and rode and rode across the Curry Tuck Sound and through the counties down to Perquimans and warned them that uh, the uh, that uh, British troops were coming to Norfolk. She did do the warning and they got up there. The battle was over by then, but uh, they were able to reinforce that group and more British troops didn't come. So there's that account. And of course we got the historic, uh, there was a book written about it and that goes back, uh, the, the book about it goes back more than a hundred years. So there's that. There are some, you know, there's some folks who claim that they were not, and I'll get to that in just a minute, that they weren't, they haven't been there the whole time. So that's why I recount some of this history. So the writer Edmund Ruffin, uh, he described them living on the barrier islands in 1860, right at about the time of the Civil War. He saw them, and there's that description as well. So then in 1982, um, <clears throat> they were at the Spanish Mustang Registry, uh, came here and did measurements and, and studies on them to figure out if they could qualify as Spanish must Mustangs. And uh, the Horsey Americas did the same thing some 15 years ago or whatever. And they found that they did have eight traits of these Spanish heritage horses that came from South America and that originally were brought over by Columbus. So they have five lumbar instead of six. They got the, there's several qualities. I name a few here, crescent shaped nostrils, ears that point toward each other. You can see in the picture here, they're kind of pointy like that and a low dock tail, which is better for balancing and uh, fast takeoffs. But we've all heard that there are Spanish Mustangs, but the uh, Equus Survival Trust and Meg and are working together with DNA studies and things that they may not be actually Sp actually Spanish Mustangs. That term, according to the uh, uh, woman at the um, Equus Survival Trust, says that that name, the Spanish Mustang, was only established and brought about for the Western forces on the Bureau of Land Management land uh, less than 100 years ago, something like that. So this trust is trying to reestablish them and Meg, working with Meg in the Corrado Wild Horse Fund to as um, banker ponies, as their own breed of horses. They've been there 500 years. They've got their own characteristics. So that's what they're working on now. And uh, the trust calls them on a critical, a critical list as far as that breed goes because there's less than 100 breeding mares. So, and then in the 40s, uh, the, the Coast Guard was there with some of their horses. This is, these are pictures of uh, Coast Guardman kind of showing off there with his horse. And they used to ride down the beach in troops and stuff. They were at the time looking for submarines off the coast here, the Coast Guard was. They were guarding the coast. That's what they do. And they were based there in Kerala. And they had a, you know, a herd of horses that they traveled on the beach with. So there's, uh, who knows who this is in this picture? Oh, good. <laughs> Everybody knows. So Ernie had his own horses. He had cattle up there. He had some buffalo at one point. And Ernie was a great guy. I interviewed him several times over the years. You know, he just died here a couple of years ago. <clears throat> It was a wealth of knowledge about the Northern Outer Banks. And uh, at some at sometimes uh, he would claim that those horses, the wild horses came from a couple of farm horses that were uh, let go in sometime in the 30s and 40s. But I also heard him 
contradict himself on that personally. So we'll go with that. And uh, and there's the proof that you know well, that these explorers and writers and others had seen these horses over a couple of centuries now, and they had recorded it. So it looks pretty likely. And the G the DNA research takes them back to many years before. So in 1984, the, the, the highway had, the paved highway went to just to the north side of Duck. Some of you may remember what was there then. It was right at the north end of Duck as you're coming up NC-12. What was there? There was a gate, a gate that had a gate there. And so the only people who could get beyond the gate, the, 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 the paved road stopped there. You couldn't get up there unless you had a uh, property up there. It was owned, that particular uh, section was owned by one developer in particular, and he did not want a paved road coming through yet. But they battled over it, the Tech County and the state battled with him over it for some years and finally uh, declared eminent domain for the path that had been built there just north of Duck. <clears throat> and I was talking to uh, Wilson Snowden, who was a commissioner at the time, um, in Curry Tuck County in the mid 80s. And he remembers the day. He, they went up there, they had a van full of people, including some state representatives and a couple of commissioners and a highway patrolman. And they stopped there at the gate. The highway patrolman got out of the van, told the guard, get out of the gatehouse. And he personally pushed the gatehouse over and they drove up. And that was uh, the beginning of the state taking over that road. And of course, it got paved over the next, next several months. So by the spring of uh, 1985, there was a paved road going through the village of Corral. And so the people weren't used to seeing horses on the road and horses weren't used to seeing people on their road. Uh, it wasn't you know, before it was paved. So there was trouble and horses started getting hit on the highway. There was one instance uh, in 1989, there were several killed that year. And in one instance, I think there were like four killed in one accident and a couple of pregnant mares were hit as well. The person was speeding through on the highway there and killed them. So that same year, these four local women formed the Corolla Wild Horse Fund and that's the beginnings of it, but they, they weren't their own nonprofit yet, but they fell under the Outer Banks Conservationists. The Outer Banks Conservationists were the ones who had restored the lighthouse grounds, the Curry Tech Beach Lighthouse grounds, and had opened the lighthouse, and they had restored the lighthouse keepers' houses. So they fell under them for the first few years there. They tried all kinds of things to stop them from getting hit on the highway. They had these uh, kind of glow-in-the-dark collars they put on them and they would tear them off or another horse would tear it off in, in within hours, days, whatever. And uh, they tried putting up signs, you know, that said something like, be careful, wild horses are here, or wild horse crossings, things like that. The signs got stolen. Everybody wanted a wild horse crossing sign. So, and they were pretty costly. So they had a hard time keeping, so the signs didn't work. Meanwhile, they worked hard to get the, uh, get a fence put up and it was not easy. That fence now goes from the, you know, 100 or 200 yards out in the ocean, goes all the way across the barrier island and into the sound to keep the horses from coming south into the village where the paved roads are. And uh, so they wanted to get a fence. It was getting approval for the fence from federal authorities, Corps of Engineers and all that was really difficult. It took them a while. And uh, then to get from there was all kinds of opinions about whether the horses would be able to stay up there, would they make it, would they survive, would the fence even stop them? And finally, they did get the fence up. And uh, in in my research, let me go back here. In my research uh, of this, I only saw where one more horse was killed because he got around the fence right away at that point on the, on the road. So it did work. If horses still get around the fence on occasion at low tides or if a breach in the fence or something like that, and Meg's had to deal with them often. Some of them have had to be put on, the, on a uh, rescue farm over on the mainland in Grandy. Uh, but generally, the fences work pretty well. So let's see here. A little bit about the story on Star. 
that this horse was kind of like the first famous wild horse. He was the dominant stallion there in the 1980s and lived in the Kerala village. And uh, with his harem of several mares, and uh, over time, of course, he had his own son, so to speak. And Drew Hodges was uh, one of the women who helped form the original Corolla Wild Horse Fund back in 1989. I talked to her several times in writing this book, and she remembers Star roaming around, seeing him on the dunes and things like that. And, and, and she said he knew he was something else. He just had this uh, you know, attitude about him. But he was in constant battles with his own son, Midnight. Uh, this picture here is a little bit of a story behind that as well. Um, so Drew Wilson is, was a photographer that worked for the Virginian Pilot, and I worked with, you know, we worked together for several years. He got there before I did in the mid-80s. So in the late 80s, early 90s, he was over there taking pictures of the wild horses. It was an ass a regular assignment and um, to go with a story. The, the, the writer wrote the story, it got published, and they did not use this photo right here, which is one of the most famous uh, wild horse photos you'll, you'll, not, you'll see. Uh, and so that photo didn't get used. So was, uh, uh, the editor of the Adderbanks magazine called him and said, do you have any photos? And he said, yeah, I've got this one. Uh, I don't know that Drew knew his name was Star, you know, and what he was exactly. It was just a routine kind of a shot for him. She uh, ran that, well, before she ran it, Star uh, was killed. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But she ran it anyway, and it became a memorial type article about him. And that uh, picture ran on the magazine. And it became famous. It, it, posters were made out of it and uh, emblems for hats and t-shirts and all kinds of things like that. And even Meg, uh, had a poster of him on her wall as a 10 year old, uh, many years before she got this job. So uh, Star was an inspiration to many people on the Kerala Wild Horses. And when he was killed, uh, it also inspired a large growth of the Wild Horse Fund and many donations. So uh, as I was talking about, he had lots of battles with his own son, Midnight. Midnight ran off. And he found him a mare up in the north banks there away from Kerala and brought her back. And uh, Star took that mare away from him too. So he couldn't win. It was a constant, it was a classic battle between father and son here. So they were, like I said, in constant battle. One day in 1991, they would, uh, Star and, and uh, Midnight had been fighting and they, he was chasing Midnight. And um, Midnight made it across NC-12, of course, by this time it's paved, but Star did not. He ran, he ran into the car at full speed chasing him and it, uh, it killed him. And so now there's a memorial plaque about him situated on the east side or the back side of the Curry Tech Beach Lighthouse. You can kind of go around there and read about it on him there. So he was like the first uh, famous wild horse that, uh, help put it on the map. Then there was another one called Little Red Man, and I covered him uh, many times. I did stories on Little Red Man because he was always getting into some sort of trouble. Uh, he loved the camera. I personally witnessed that horse walking up to Drew Wilson taking pictures, you know, and uh, kind of grinning at the camera. It was amazing to see him be like that. He loved people food. And uh, one time he got, uh, he crawled up the side of a, uh, he went up the steps on the side of a um, beach cottage and uh, after a piece of pizza and he fell. And as he fell, he hit his head on a water faucet and cut himself. And uh, even though he got up and he was okay after that, the scar remained with him the rest of his life. He was one of the horses that raided a fruit and vegetable stand down there in the village of Kerala and they couldn't do much about it. He kept getting it. When they did get up the fence, he was used to living in the um, village. He kept getting around the fence and they kept trying to have to round him up and get him back. And they did it over and over. At this time, the herd managers were uh, Gene and Donna Snow and uh, they were a couple. 
that uh, had been hired to do that part-time. They, they lived in Virginia Beach and would come down when there was something that needed to be done. But the roundup, I was there from the day they uh, round up a uh, little red man and it was a job. I was standing there, they had a, they had a corral, a, a, a kind of a quickly, they had, a, they had fence uh, sections and made a corral uh, around him. They got him, he was off to some area of corral. They finally herded him up there, this one little section of corral. They had a trailer there ready to get him into it and uh, a corral around him. They, find, they just had to put it up as they could get him closer and closer to that trailer. And Gene was in the middle of that corral trying to get him to go into that trailer. And that horse did not want to go. And uh, he knocked Gene flying one time. And I remember Gene's glasses going out the, out the fence there. And uh, he had to get those, put them back on. And then so they worked him back. And then one thing that did seem to work was some food. And they got him, finally got him. I think they had to back him in, if I'm not mistaken, into that trailer. So they moved him to Dews Island, which is an island off uh, Curry Tuck County on the mainland, right behind the, um, let's see, cotton gin, the cotton gin, right. That's where he lived with, uh, with his harem that kept coming around the fence. That's all he could do. He kept coming around, they couldn't stop him. All they could do is move him. So they did that for his own safety and for the safety of those mares. And this is a picture of him at Dews Island. He's out in the water there, this picture of little red man. So, uh, so some he died in in on on Dews Island in 2008, <clears throat> and some of his offspring still live at the rescue farm there in Granny. So the fences, the first fence was built from one end to the other, one side of the other, and uh, that's not an easy undertaking and takes a lot. Of, it's very expensive, and uh, they built that first one in 1995. And uh, the horses were still sometimes going up into the Virginia Beach area. They'd go up through uh, Back Bay National Wildlife Refuge into the Sandbridge area and get hit on the road up there. So uh, they built another fence at the north end and right on the Virginia, uh, Virginia North Carolina line. And it looks similar to this fence. And that was uh, built in 2003. Now, they had put a, a small fence across just the beach area right up into the dunes back in the 70s to keep traffic from going up into the Fallscape State Park and Back Bay National Wildlife Refuge. They wanted to stop that traffic from uh, going and running over any kind of wildlife that's up there. So the locals didn't like that fence at all. They called it the Iron Curtain. And uh, they fought with them on that. And finally, they got keys. They issued, the federal government issued about Ernie Bowden was in the middle of that, of course. He went to jail at least once. While he was a commissioner, <laughs> he was in jail and uh, for breaching that fence. He would just go up, he'd go up into the dune and go around it and come back and go on up there. Because see, they were used to going to the doctor, visiting family, going to work, going north. Instead of coming south all the way through Duck, they went north. So that fence stopped all that and they fought it. And they finally uh, did get keys to about 50 locals, but you couldn't pass them on, you couldn't uh, sell them or anything like that. And now I understand there's like less than 10, if I'm not mistaken. So they finally got that worked out and now there's only a few. So in the 90s, once the fence went up, people wanted to start seeing the wild horses. And so they started, uh, entrepreneurs started creating wild horse tours. And there were hundreds of people even today, still hundreds a day, go up there. I see them when I work up there in a museum now. And hundreds of people a day fill those trucks and go rumbling up there. And they take a couple hours and find those horses. And one of the tricks is, is to find fresh horse dung on the road. I joke to some of the families that come into the museum. I say, yeah, find it. But you look what looks like fresh horse dung and get your, your daughter to go out there and test it and see if it's fresh. And that's one way of finding the horses. So hundreds of others drive themselves up there too. So that's been a, um, a booming business. There's still like seven companies up there that, that take to the trip to the Sea of Wild Horses. One of the first ones was, um, um, uh, Bob White, he started one of the first ones up there. And then there were some others as well. Wild Horse Adventure Tours was another one. And it expanded from there. 
So this is a photo of a car that had hit one of the popular standards, uh, stallions there named Two Socks. He, he was evidently speeding. He got some uh, citations for it. So these are the human interaction. It can be good and it can be bad. So we've got some real good people uh, working with the horses very closely. The Corolla Wild Horse Fund, and they've got others up there in the North Beach area watching out for them and trying to keep them safe. And uh, this is Meg and Nora, is that you too? Yeah, in this picture here, and they've got a, a, a young foal here that they're trying to take care of. And the other picture over here is a, a, a group of riders that were helping to herd the, some of the horses that got across the fence to get them back on the north side and get there. So uh, the Koala Wild Horse Fund is, spends lots of times and money, uh, and money. It's, it's a 24 seven job trying to keep up. Uh, they get calls all hours of the night uh, when things happen up that way. And they respond right, no matter what time or what day, Christmas, whatever. And uh, so they take them to, this is, this is at a, uh, a nursing home here. The horse is there. It brings a great de deal of cheer to those folks there. I'm hoping not to be there soon, but anyway. But it'll be okay if they bring a wild horse to help cheer me up. <laughs> the other, the other uh, picture here is of Amadeo, the blind horse, and I'm gonna talk about him in just a minute. The, they're very gentle, and there's a little child there standing next to him. He's at the farm there. And uh, so human food, people leave, you know, some of their trash behind. This is a picture of some watermelons and stuff that's not good for the horses to eat. There's been young horses that have choked to death on apples and nearly choked to death on apples that they've eaten. The other picture, some of them can be, um, the wild horses, once they're tamed, can, are very rideable. And this is at the farm. So in 20, uh, 2001, um, there were four horses that were shot and another one run over in one night. And uh, I remember covering it. I wrote about it when it happened. And uh, the Curry Tuck Sheriff's Department went to the scene course and they investigated it. And uh, even to, that they would not let me see the incident report at the time and even I called as I was writing this book just a year and a half ago, I called about getting a report, a written report on this uh, investigation about these horses and they, the sheriff would not let me have it. He says it's an open investigation. It's 20 years later. But he did let me talk to two of the deputies that had investigated it. <clears throat> when they got there, it had already been like a couple of days or something before since they'd been shot. And they could tell they'd been shot and he could tell the one had been run over. And um, so there was no evidence of all. There was no uh, ballistic type evidence. There were no witnesses. It was in the middle of the night. It was in November when there weren't many people up there. There weren't any houses close by. And uh, so they looked into it. The sheriff, the deputy told me, we went all the way to Juan Cheese to uh, interview certain people. And there just never was any conclusion to come to. And they never, sounds like from what I can tell, never got, got close to solving it. And of course, uh, they are horses and not people. So the investigation finally did, you know, they stopped looking into it after a while. So then they've, uh, now they have a rescue farm. It's uh, over 30 acres over in Grande, <clears throat> Grandy. And it's appropriately appropriately named Bessie Dowdy Road, the little girl who rode her wild horse to warn the um, revolutionaries. There's somewhere around 20 horses there that changes every once in a while. I was just there this past Saturday and uh, they're healthy and well taken care of. And um, those are the horses that get sick and can't, when, once they take them off the beach from being sick or hurt or injured, uh, they can't go back after that. And some of the horses, a few of them just won't stay. They figured out how to get around the fence and they won't stay there. So sometimes they have to be put on the farm. <clears throat> now, during the summer, they have a, a weekly on Wednesdays, an open house. And they just had another one this past Saturday, open house where you can go there and see the horses. You can touch many of them and uh, get to know them a little bit including Raymond the Mule, who I'm going to talk to in just a minute, talk about just a minute. I talk to him once in a while, too. Especially if I can get a marshmallow, 
he talks to you pretty good. All right, so foals, the little foals they have in recent years have uh, five, six, seven a year. I think they've had seven this year. And so um, they total the, the whole herd somewhere around 100, maybe a little more right now. They're born naturally in the wild. They're not, you know, have any special vet care or anything like that. They're just there and they're born as they naturally would be. And in recent years, they started uh, having be naming them according to the alphabet. So they started a few years ago with the A's and B's, C. This year's D year. So you know, we've had a lot of horses named with D names this year, such as Dove is one of them. And here's some pictures of the little horses. They, uh, you know, they get protected by the herd, and they're watched over by their mother. And they're very frisky. This is one back in the uh, maritime forest area kicking around. Another yeah. one out on one of the uh, lots that's in the uh, next to one of the canals there. And they get the zoomies just like a dog will, you know. And they'll run around up and down and kick and kick their legs up and everything. So it's pretty fun to watch. Uh, a little bit about their habitat. Um, so this, the story, the, what the picture here on the um, on your left there was taken by Drew Wilson like 25 years ago. This is the boardwalk there at the um, North Carolina Estuarine um, Preserve. And uh, so you very rarely see a horse there, but on occasions they, they like to take the boardwalk as well. <laughs> And then they, they'll get up under the houses and leave presents there. And uh, there was one uh, uh, realtor who offered a, a golden shovel, you know, you, to go with your house. <laughs> it was painted gold. <laughs> but uh, they, you know, they had to scoop it because some people were complaining about the horse manure at the underneath their decks, you know. And so he, he'd give them a shovel here. Here's our service for that. And they're out there in the wintertime and it snows and uh, they get kind of a heavy furry coat there in the wintertime so that they can be guarded against that. Um, they live back in the marshes and the trees. They'll hide in the maritime, the thickets of the maritime forest. They go back on the sound. They're up in the dunes. They uh, eat the grasses there. They um, are back in that forest. That's along the fence there. The, and then uh, they walk along those roads that crisscross up there in Corova Beach. And of course the egrets eat insects that they stir up and live on them. They have a, a symbiotic relationship. They roll on the sand in the beach when the flies are bad. A lot of them will come to the beach when the black flies are biting real bad. And then they get into the sound and any canals there and take a bath. They'll eat the, uh, they eat the grasses in there, the milfoil and stuff. Uh, then you can see there's a fair, fair good, fairly good size uh, meadows up there that they graze in. And this is an aerial photo uh, of the horses here. And you can, if you look closely, uh, I don't know, and you see the horses there, they're in the water. So that's just a big overall shot of the marsh and the ponds that they drink out of. A lot of people come to the museum, where do they get their water? Well, there's enough fresh water that they go to these ponds and the canals and drink out of it. So fighting stallions, that's what got Star killed. And they, when they get into a fight, it's ferocious and it's single-minded and they're not paying attention to anything else going on. It's dangerous to anyone who's around them. I remember a story of one guy, uh, he was trying to mow his grass and a couple of horses started fighting and uh, he had to just get out of the way, you know, because it was not his yard anymore at that point. These are a couple more photos of these horses fighting each other. These are in the book. All these photos are in the book too. So, so now they're doing DNA studies. Uh, they shoot them with a dart that pops back out and it takes a little skin and hair sample and they send them off to Dr. Gus Cothran at Texas A&M University. He's an expert in this stuff. He's done studies on uh, DNA studies on these wild horses for more than 20 years. He did his first one way back, uh, like the late 90s, early 2000s. <clears throat> and so they've been tying the lines of recent descended uh, um, mothers, fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers, that sort of thing, the recent descendants. And it's also helping to discover their heritage. There are lines that show the, uh, the uh, connection to some of the 
horses that Columbus brought over, those breeds of horses that were done down there in South America. They tie to those. So we'll get into a little bit about in some of the individuals here. You know, Amadeo was a blind horse. Uh, I understand at least one of his eyes was put out in a fight. And uh, he was the only horse, he's got this distinction, the only horse to be saved from the surf, the ocean surf. So he was blinded and he ran out into the surf one day and got caught on a rip current and managed to get his footing on a sandbar out there, but wouldn't come back. He's blind. He didn't know which way he was back anyway. So then the rescue service uh, got involved and they got a rope and a line around him and I think a strap around his backside. They had a vehicle up there on the beach and gradually guided him off that sandbar back into the surf and out of the surf again and saved his life. So he has that distinction. Uh, he died in March 2020 on the farm field. Uh, she, he was held by Meg herself. I think she had a camera there in her house. She knew that he was in bad shape and in trouble. And she saw him struggling one evening, I don't know, about midnight or something, right? Or, yeah, late, late one night. And she uh, went there to the farm and held him in her arms as he died. So I don't know, he must have been 25 or 30 years old. At that point. 40 years old, Amadeo was. So he goes back to the early days of the late 80s when midnight was the reigning force around. There's a horse named Trade Wind. Uh, he had terrible problems with his legs and hoofs and might have been put down, but he was brought to a farm in Smithfield uh, where the guy there runs a farm where he helps uh, troubled youth and he brought him back to health. And this is going back, I don't know, some 20 years ago, brought him back to health and got his feet back in good shape and, taught it and, and got him to where he was tamed so he could ride him. And he entered him in 2011, I believe it was. Uh, he entered him into the Horse of the Americas uh, Trail Horse Contest and uh, trade win. You, you do it for a year. You ride on trails over an entire year, different trails. You make a recording of it, how far you went and all this and what the trail was. And trade win won that contest. It's a national contest and he won it. So for the Horse of the Americas, it's Trail Horse of the Year. The other horse is uh, Montauk, they called him. The Gene and Donna Snow were uh, the head of the horse fund at the time. You remember the four horses that were killed and the other one that was run over. One of them was this horse's mother and he was left behind as a abandoned foal. And uh, they left him for a while, hoping that he could get hooked up with another harem of horses and, and survive. Well, uh, later on, a uh, realtor found him lying in the weeds there, not far from one of her houses she was showing, and found him there, uh, hungry and sick and not doing well. And so she saved him. Had she not found him, he would have died there more than likely. So that's how many times has he survived so far? <laughs> Two times. And uh, so they uh, they took him in and took the, the, the snows took Montauk up to their farm in Virginia Beach. While he was up there, still growing and still recovering, a pack of wild dogs got a hold of him and nearly killed him. They saved him from them and nursed him back to help from that. So here he is. This is just this picture was current as I was writing the book just a year or so ago, and they sent me this picture of him. So he's you know at least twenty some years old now and looks pretty healthy. So he is a survivor. This horse is. And then there's Romer. Uh, he was he's called that because he kept roaming to the other side of the fence. He kept going around it. They couldn't stop him. Uh, there were many efforts to capture him before they finally got him with a, a really, they had to up the potency of the dart. Uh, this was uh, Karen McAlpin who was in charge then, and uh, she would personally go out there trying to shoot the dart into this horse, and they started calling her Annie Oakley because of the, her prowess as a shooter. She'd hit him. But the dose wasn't strong enough. The horse was just a strong horse and he'd get away anyway before they could capture him. So they had to uh, up the dosage and finally knocked him down good enough with one of her shots that they were able to bring him in. And uh, so he was taken to the farm. I think this is uh, 
one of the first horses that Meg, she was just coming on them, Meg and uh, Nora, uh, first got to know was Romer in what, 2016 or so. So uh, he was taken back to the farm and Meg had the job of trying to get this horse acclimated to being on a farm and not wild. Remember how wild he was and even that big old fence could not hold him. So she figured re reading Misty of Chinkatig might help and it did. It helped to get him to adapt. So he became a star of the wild horses and was on billboards and pamphlets and things like that. He died in 2019 at the farm. And then this handsome gentleman is Raymond. <laughs> so he's about, I don't know, 30 years old now, something like that, or more, or more. And uh, so you can tell his teeth are giving him a little trouble there. <laughs> Um, but I was, I was there at the farm one day and uh, Meg went out there with a marshmallow calling for him, Ray, 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 Ray. And he comes running out there, hee hawing. And uh, he was a funny, he was so funny. He's still picky about his food and he has to live on a separate pen. And so when the, uh, um, when he was still in the, on the, in the wild, he, uh, he would hee haw, you know, and people would call to say, what's, there's a horse that's sick out here. What's wrong? It's just Raymond. It's okay, you know. And Raymond, uh, I talked to Ernie Bowden before he died about Raymond. This is years ago because I did a story on him while he was still in the wild. Talked to uh, Ernie and Ernie says that he had a uh, <clears throat> a uh, horse uh, from a, uh, I mean a donkey from a petting zoo in Virginia Beach. Ernie did. And somehow that donkey got out and mated with one of the wild mares. And that's where you get Raymond from, because he's a mule and he can't reproduce, but he didn't know that. He liked having his own harem of horses and he would uh, you know, defend those mares hard as any stallion could. He, he was a little bit smaller than they were, so he'd go low, you know, with, with these great teeth right here and some of his hoofs and stuff and was able to fend them off. And then he finally had some hoof and uh, hoof problems and stuff. And they finally, uh, he was limping around up there. So they finally had to pull him back to the, uh, to the farm too. And he's still there. All right, that concludes it. Uh, the Wild Horse Fund is named that for a reason because they, they do need your donations. They depend on it to take care of the operations that they do, taking care of the horses at the farm and getting vet care for some of the wilder horse, the wild horses up there that, that run into trouble and to have people take care of them and all that. And so they, uh, this horse here is one they call Blossom. She recently had some hoof issues and, and she's there at the farm now just recently. And uh, she was there at the open some Saturday of since seems to be adjusting pretty well. So if you have any questions, that's the end of the presentation. Please uh, ask them and I'll see if I can answer. If not, I got experts over here. Yes, ma'am. Um, the, uh, the wild horses in Oak Island, are they the same as the wild horses or not? Not anymore. I'm sure they came from similar lines, but they've been separated for hundreds of years. And the Ogrecoke horses are kind of fenced into a small area and are have, have a lot more special care and direct care than the Corolla wild horses. And you had a question? Um, I was wondering, particularly in the beginning, was there a problem because there wasn't that many of them uh, with inbreeding? They have thought that there might be some inbreeding uh, at times. I know Karen McAlpin, when she was there, she got real concerned about it because the herd was too small to, for, for genetic diversity, they were calling it. And they had a couple of uh, foals that had uh, something wrong with their hoofs and she, that they were born that way. So she thought that might be the problem. But it hasn't happened since. So not so sure about that. And uh, Back in like 2000, they did a, um, a management agreement to where you the, the, the herd was not supposed to be bigger than 60 horses. The federal government and the Curry Tuck National Wildlife Refuge up there did not want to have a, a larger herd uh, coming into the uh, refuge and eating the grasses and vegetation needed for the ducks. But in like 2018, I called the, uh, the um, 
refuge manager when I was writing this book. <clears throat> and uh, they've opened that up. They didn't, they didn't enforce the 60 horses real tight. It, from every, I went through every story I'd written for years and years. And there was always somewhere around 100. It got up to about 120 in like uh, 2011, 12, 13. It got up to about 11 or 12, uh, 120 or so then. And now it's back down to in the lower uh, 100s. Yes, sir. How do they interact with water? Evidently, they know what to do. They, that, I don't remember. I don't remember hearing of them getting bit by a snake. Yeah, I guess they can. There's a lot of water moccasins up there. Oh, yeah. yeah, I've seen them myself. We've had some in the park. We're slithering down the road in the park there. And on the grounds of the Wellhead Club, we had we have a big uh, function every Wednesday during the summer. And there was one right there in the grass. It's a water moccasin. And we just left him, you know, uh, hoping that a kid wouldn't get close to him. No, uh, we made sure he was. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, are the um, stallions, uh, because of their uh, behavior, natural behavior, are they statistically more likely to be in physical or vehicle collisions than the mares? Uh, it does seem like stallions get hit more. I don't know. What are, is there statistics on that? Or? I'd have to like sit down and actually, I haven't really paid that much attention. To it, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the stallions are probably going to be a bit more unpredictable if they're fighting and starting yeah. Yeah, because quite often you they'll, they'll, they'll get hit at night too, and uh, they'll I, I know a deputy that hit hit a horse and it was devastating for him. He was a Curry Tech deputy. He was going slower than the speed limit, and uh, up the beach, and a horse came charging over the dunes right in front of him and slammed right into his patrol car, and he was devastated. Of course, he reported it and everything, and he, he didn't get any trouble because it wasn't his fault. But it, they had to put down the horse, you know, because of it. So <clears throat> they, they uh, bring it upon themselves on some occasions. Sometimes people are up there driving too fast. The speed limit's 15 miles an hour a, a year when there's people close by. You can drive up to like 30, 35 miles an hour when nobody's around. So sometimes at night, people get up there going a little bit too fast. So, yeah. They have on occasion, yeah. Uh, they, the female horses will get hit on occasion. I think there's more stallions that get hit, but yeah, occasionally if, uh, the the mares will get hit too. So they're all vulnerable to it. Yeah. And I don't know. I've recently, just to bring it up, you know, talking about horses getting in trouble. There's been a few that have get cuts on their leg or something, and they'll get into some standing water that has back uh, flesh eating bacteria in it. And that's caused some issues. We've had a couple die from that. <clears throat> some of them they've had to rush to Raleigh to the vet and get surgery and just did save him, Riptide, I believe was his name. And there was one mayor. June. Huh? June. June. The one mayor, June, died. Oh, no, June lives. So Riptide oh. and June lives. But oh. yet we lost two and saved two. Okay, lost two and saved two from this flesh eating bacteria. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is there found out what's causing that particularly? Well, yeah, I mean, it's caused by, um, it's it's rotting plant matter in the, in in, the water. And so when you don't get a solid freeze in the wintertime, you kill a lot of that stuff off, but it just continues to grow. Gotcha. Grow. Yeah. So that's another issue that's popped up in recent years. <clears throat> so any other questions? Yes. How many stallions are there and what happens if it dies? Midnight, I understand, uh, went up to the North Beach area, and uh, I'm not sure they know what happened to him eventually. There was another horse named Midnight Star who did get bit by a snake, and they ended up having to put him down. This is 20-some years ago, but I never, I don't remember seeing anything more about Midnight, the horse. Have y'all had seen anything about him? No, there's nothing else that I know of out there. I didn't, yeah. What are the driving restrictions if you want to go up in your own box? Well, uh, driving restrictions, you there's not a lot of restrictions. In the summertime now, the Curry Tech Commissioners have made you get a permit if you're going to park for any length of time. But to just drive up there, you're still okay to do that. Of course, you, you can't go faster than 15 miles an hour when there's people 
I don't, they don't give an exact distance, and it'll be close by. And then if there's nobody around, you can go up to 35 miles an hour. And of course, you want to uh, uh, lower the air in your tires below um, 20 pounds and um, be ready for that because you and have a four wheel drive with a little bit of clearance. There's a there's a Facebook call page uh, called Corolla Beach Idiots, and they they post every time somebody gets stuck, they get put on there. And uh, I covered I covered I don't know how many times there was people up there. I didn't cover every every time somebody got stuck, but when there was something unusual, and uh, one time a, a semi truck was driving following his GPS until it was too late. He went right off the pavement into the sand. And before he knew it, he was in, you know, axle deep in the sand in that big old truck and couldn't get turned around. So they had to call Cito's towing up there. Uh, I think it's Kitty Hawk. And uh, he has one of those uh, boom type uh, tow trucks that the boom can swing around and lift heavy objects. And that's how they finally got that truck back off the beach there. I was up there one time doing a story and uh, <clears throat> a lady, in high heels and dressed to the nines, was standing there in the sand, you know, wondering what to do. Her Toyota, her nice Toyota uh, sedan was buried to the axle. And we asked her, what are you doing out here? Says, my GPS took me up here. I was trying to get to a uh, real, realtor's meeting in Avon, which is in the entirely other direction. So, we dug her out and got her going again, and she got stuck again just before she got to the pavement. So she got out in her high heels again. And of course, she we had to dig her high heels out too. So, no, I'm just kidding. And we finally got her on the pavement, and she was on her way to. It's probably late though at this point. Yes, ma'am. Have the horses still get down into the area that's frequented by? Uh, homeowners that rent out houses in Koala. They yeah, still get down there. they still get down there on occasion. What was it called? The Renegade Six there came down. They were constantly down there, and there were there's still been some recently. They leave their their presence known, you know, when they come in overnight or whatever, all around the Whalehead Club grounds. They'll leave remnants of themselves there and their DNA, so to speak. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I'll be out here signing bits here. Just a minute.